I found what I did wrong, um, or I won't even say that. I, I'm not 100% sure what I did wrong, but I corrected it to get the example that was not working last time to be working. So we'll start off by looking at that and... Is it because you brought in PD instead? Pardon me? Is it, is it because you brought in PD? Um, that, that was, yeah, I mean, that was ultimately the cause of it. And the, the thing is, what, what's, what's tough is that um, when you're up here, and, and sometimes even when you make a small mistake, it, it shakes you up a little bit, and you start getting nervous, and you start doing stuff, and, you know, and trying things, and, and it, it doesn't go well once, once you make a mistake and things go downhill. So I've, I've made some pretty minor mistakes that have really thrown me in the middle of a lecture, you know, but. <coughs> it happens to all of us. Just picture us naked. It'll, it'll go away. No. Please don't. Yeah. No. <laughs> That's not happening. Are we recording yet? Yes. <laughs> Glad to see you're, you're, you're back in form today, David. I mentioned how I've had David for like a bunch of classes and he never shows up on time. Oh. Never, ever. And then the one time he showed up on time just to spite me, I think. But then <laughs> now, he's, now he's back to normal. Yeah, last class. <laughs> Well, you got to remember, if I pick on you, it's because I like you, except for Alan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to go further for a second. Yeah. That was, that was All right, so let's, let's look at this. The idea here, we're going after two ideas here uh, in last example. The one idea was the idea of writing code that <laughs> creates all the objects that we need for database interactivity, but not having a visual component associated with it. For example, we talked about a login screen. You really don't need a um, visual component to it, right? You just you need the text boxes to accept the user ID and password, but when you go and do the database query, you just want to see does that row exist in the database or not. And if it does, they can log on. If not, they don't. So I wrote code that did that, that, that accessed um, the database without um, having, a, having it tied to a visual aspect. The other thing that we did is we did um, session management, where we're going to store this in a session variable and then use it later on. So let's go and look at this. Just out of curiosity, I, I don't know if you know or not, uh, if you were to just uh, click and drag it out of the toolbox, the login and everything, right. would it automatically do this code for you, or do you still have to do this code? Um, you do have to do some code and configuring. Yeah. It doesn't do, doesn't do everything for you. But yeah, it gives you sort of a framework again, so it gives yeah. you a start. All right, so let's run this and look, and let's find that it does work. Let me look up what I put in. I know the password's password. Right. I, I have. I think and I have two. I think I have two users. M Zellers, password of password. I thought you just did M Z. I thought you had M L Z. M L Z. Yeah. Okay. M L Z. Password of password. And there it goes and it shows my information. Yay. The other thing I could do is I put in D Huffman and see if we can guess what the password is here. Capital P A dollar sign dollar sign W O R D. I've tried it. Oh, unsuccessful. You're wrong. He doesn't have it as his primary email password. Let me let me look. Maybe maybe I just said Huffman instead of D Huffman. Let's look. D H. All right, D H. 
and there's Don Huffman's information. Lastly, if I get something wrong, well, we've already seen that. It shows you that it's unsuccessful. All right, so let's look at the code that we had. And, and I had most of it last time. There was just a few subtle things. I think what I did is I tried to create a new data reader object. Given that uh, iDataReader is an interface and not an object or it's an abstract class or something, I forget, it wouldn't allow me to create a new instance of that. So I was not, I'm not able to say, I'm pretty sure this is what I did wrong. I'm not able to say equals new And sure enough, it tells me, can I create an instance of the abstract class or interface? All right. So that's what I did wrong. I tried to create the class All right, using a new. I can, however, given that this function returns one of these, returns some class that inherits from or implements that interface, I can go and do this. So that was the difference. That was my mistake. Um, that I did last time. Anyhow, let's review what we have. Um, I create my data source object. My data source, again, is going to be the, the pipeline to the database. I create my, or I set the connection string for my data source. I tell it what database it is linked to. And in this case, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm linking to it uh, using a database connection that I already have defined before. So it is in the um, web config file. I need to pull two parameters from that, the provider name and the connection string. We can look at those. This is the information in effect, the provider, Microsoft, or the connection string is this, the provider is system data Olay DB. So we provide the information necessary to make a connection to the database. We set our SQL statement. The select command for a SQL statement. Select player ID from player where user ID equals question mark and user password equals question mark. Again. This is pretty much like what we did through the visual interface, except we're actually writing out the commands that, that, that do this. All right? Because we have two parameters in our SQL statement, we have to say where the data is coming from. In other words, where does that first question mark get filled in from? Where does that second question mark get filled in from? Well, the first question mark gets filled in from the user ID text box. The second question mark gets filled in from the user password text box, from the password text box. I then specify the mode that I'm going to use here in my data source. And the mode depends on what I'm going to do with the data once I've retrieved it. You have two choices here, data reader and something else, data set. And the difference between these is the data reader is a simpler way of accessing the data. It allows us to sort of loop through the data and read it sequentially one at a time. The data set allows for a lot more versatility and you can, you can jump around and, and so on down the line. Since we're just going to do a straight read of the data, we're just looking to see, in fact, we're, we're actually even simpler than that. We're just going to look to see if it retrieved anything, right? Because if it retrieved anything, it means that we have someone that matches that user ID and password. So we're just going to look to see if this SQL statement gives us any data, all right? And we don't have to loop through anything or, or anything. If it gives us data, it means that we have a match. 
Then, so therefore, we don't need the data set. The data set would be for more extensive things. We're going to update the stuff or whatever. Um, in this case, we're not, so we're going to take that because it's, it's lower overhead, lower resources involved. I then go and have the offending instruction from last time where I create my result set, if you will, my data reader, my data that can be read, and put it in something called my data and we execute the select statement associated with the data source. Effectively, what that's going to do is that's going to give me a list of rows in my data that I can loop through. All right, it's going to give me a list of rows. It's like an array that I can loop through. And I can look at one line at a time. My data read simply says grab the next item on the list. Well, again, keep in mind in this case, there's only going to be one row in our result set. That's not completely <coughs> true. There will either be zero rows or there will be one row in our result set. So if I do a read, it's either going to find something or not find something. Again, in this particular case, because the user ID is unique. There can't be two people with the same user ID. So I do the read. I find something or I don't. If I put in the user ID and password correctly, I find something. If I don't find something, that means that there's nothing in the database that matches that user ID or password. All right? This my data read function, what it does is it grabs the next row in the result set. And it returns a Boolean. Notice how it says if my data read. That's the equivalent of saying if my data read equals true. All right? Remember, what's between the parentheses in a conditional like that is a Boolean expression. That is an expression that can be evaluated to be either true or false. In this case, since the function simply returns a true or false, we don't even have to do a test. It's either going to be true or it's going to be false. If it has found something and we do a read, it's going to return true. So we have a successful logon. If it has not returned anything and my data read returns false, then we have an unsuccessful logon. So if it's unsuccessful, that means that there's no rows to read. There was no match for that user ID and password in the database. So we return a text of unsuccessful. And we put that in the text and, and we just continue. Now we could do something more extensive like keeping track of how many attempts and locking people out and all that, but we didn't in this example. We were doing a pretty straightforward example. If, however, if, however, we have success, if we go and read something and there's something there, it's a successful logon. I'm grabbing the zeroth element out of my reader and I'm storing that as the player ID. What does that mean, zero? First place Not the row. It is. Well, no. What does that represent in the select statement? My data is zero. Represents the zeroth column in my select statement. All right. My data is only going to have one row at a time. So that's why it's not the row number. My data shows you always the current row, the last row that it read in. What the zero represents is the zeroth column in our select. And we only really have one column in our select, the player ID. But lo and behold, that's the one we need, right? So I'm going to store that player ID in the session variable called player. Yes. So this my data, this, because I don't see like a loop here or anything, this handles all that like behind the scenes and all that, like to loop through all the, all the rows? Well, what, well, good question. No. Okay. 
Why is there no loop here? Because it's going to read all the data at once and you don't need to go back a second time to make sure it's either going to get it the first time or it's not going to get it at all. But you're saying the data reader is reading every single line, every single row of the database. So is it just looking for a match? Once it finds a match, then it's... It no. Through. No, the data reader isn't reading every single row in the database. What is the data reader reading? The player. Every row in that column. No. Is the player login and the player password? Or user it, login, user password? It, the data reader is reading the results of this query. Uh, Select player ID from player, where user ID equals question mark I got you. and password equals Because you, you threw me off when you said like, with the array and all that. Well, the, the results that it's going to look like this. This is what my data is going to look like. <laughs> my data is going to look like this. It's going to have a row for each row that was returned. So there's going to be one row for every row, the SQL statement returned. How do you access the next row on the list? By doing read. So my data <coughs> that read points this guy at the next row on the list. So if I do one my data read, it's pointing at the first row in here. Each row consists of a an array of columns, depending on what I asked for. statement said select player ID first name last name dot 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 then this zeroth column would represent the player ID column one would represent the first name column two would represent the last name all right so, in our particular case, the way we've written the SQL statement, we know there can only be one row returned because we're looking for someone that matches that username and password. And by definition, there's only one person that can match that. So I know there's only going to be one row in the database. So my data read is going to grab that first row of my result set. And that row is going to have the... And that row is going to have column zero... And it could have column one and column two, but it doesn't. In our case, we only have column zero. So, when you're using a data reader like this, you look at one row at a time. And read gives you the next row on the list. All right? And then the subscript of the array returns the column. So, in that way... I'm going to get one row, because I'm looking matching the user ID and password, and I'm getting one column, the zeroth column, which is a player ID. I'm stuffing that in a session variable. All right? What's a session variable? Again, it's something that keeps its value until the session dies. What can make a session die? A couple things can make a session die. One thing that can make a session die would be a timer. timer. Right, thank you. Uh, in other words, if the server hasn't heard from a client within a certain predefined time, and it can be changed per, it can be changed dynamically. In other words, Angel could have a 15 minute timeout, except when you go into a quiz, then it's a two hour timeout or something like that. If it times out, if there's no activity, if the server doesn't get any request from a client within a certain period of time, then the session's going to time out and it will lose those session variables. 
The other way that it will lose the session variables is if you explicitly log out. And we'll look at that at some point. I don't know if we'll look at that today or not, of explicitly logging out. So at any rate, we now have in our session variable, this is how you create a session variable, simply session, and in the, in, in the square brackets, put the name of what you want to call the session variable. So just to create a logout then, you would literally just have to add a button and then switch the session variable to, in this case, nothing? Uh, actually, even easier than that. There's a, a, a command that you, there, there's a method you can call on the session object, Abandon. That that essentially wipes stuff, wipes the session. So I would create a button. If I wanted to log off, I'd create a button on click session dot abandon. But then, but then the, the session variable feels bad. Yeah, that's the therapy life. and all that. Then the like, session kind of variable issues, feels bad. It's abandoned. Everything's Father's Day drinks. drinks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. All right. Then notice what I do is I re redirect that's to player that's info. All right. I redirect to player info. Now let's look at player info. Player info, I think we wrote last time. I don't. I, I think we did that. Player info is going to be a lot like any other page that we've seen so far. It's going to have a data source, and it doesn't have a grid view. It has a details view. Why is that? Well, we know that this is only going to contain one row, right? If we're only allowing someone to see their player information, that's why we're having them log in, right? That they can only see one row in the database. So we know we're not going to have a table of data. We're not going to have a grid of data. So instead of a grid view, I'm using a details view here. A details view is what uh, accommodates the... Um, the um, ability to um, accommodate the ability to uh, just show one thing, just show one row. All right. Other than that, they work very similar. You can go in and you can edit the fields, you can tie it to a data source, and so on. The only difference is really the way that it's displayed. You actually can show more than one row in a detail view. Um, but usually you don't, all right? And it, it'll typically show a block of one at a time. And then you can page it and you know, whatever, but you can experiment with that. The interesting thing here is the SQL data source, which looks a lot like everything we've done so far with one difference, right? What do we want to see? We want to see everything in the player table where player ID equals question mark, all right? In the past, we have bound that question mark to a control. We've used a, a drop-down, for example. We've also used uh, to pass data on the query string to say, okay, grab the value for the ID from the query string. Where are we using it? Where do you suppose we're going to use it in this case? Where are we getting that value from? From the session variable. From the session variable. So sure enough, if I look here, that question mark, where does it get filled from? One of the options is a session variable. Now, we have to specify what the name of our session variable is, because we actually could keep track of a bunch of stuff, right? In this case, I'm just remembering the one piece of data. I'm just remembering the um, player's ID. I could remember other stuff. I could have a session variable and remember the player's name, for example. That way I wouldn't have to go back to the database and refresh it if, if, uh, if uh, I wanted to display the name on, on top, like welcome Mike or something like that, all right? But I put in player ID there, all right? That's the name of the session variable. So when this goes to, to query it, it's going to go and return um, the row in the player table that matches up with that player ID from the session variable. And that's where when Huffman logs in, he sees Huffman's information. When Zeller's logs in, he sees Zeller's information. Question. 
Now, one thing that we should accommodate is this. What if I try to go directly to the player info page without going through the login? You want to bounce them back to the login. Yeah, it ain't working, right? Why is it not working? It's not working because there's nothing in that session variable. So it can't retrieve the player and it displays a blank screen. So really what I want to do is I want to send them to the login screen if there's nothing in the session variable. So what is my test to see if a person is logged on or not? What am I going to test? The session variable. And which session variable? The one you get from the login. Right. And what was the name of that one? Uh, player ID. Player ID. Right. Player ID. So I'm going to see if there's anything in there. Where am I going to put the code to test that? Uh, the .cs. Page load. The .cs, the page load of playerinfo.aspx. So let's go in here, double click. We're in the player load event. I'm going to say something like if session dot I'm sorry, not session dot. Session player ID Yeah, we do. What's our test here? If the session player ID equals null, what do I want to do? Redirect. And how do I redirect? Response.redirect. Response Again, the, the thing to remember for me, the, the thing that, that helps me remember this, is that remember that anytime you're talking about the communication between the client and the server, there's a request and a response. The request is stuff from the client going to the server. The response is something from the server going to the client. Here the server wants to tell the client to go somewhere else, so it's going to be the response. Let's find out. So I go and run this. Sure enough, I tried to access player info. It takes me right back to the default page. So I can go type that in. Player info ASPX. So I type that in. It sends me back to the default page. So it protects that. All right. Question about this. Now, is that something you obviously want to put on every single page, or can it be loaded into the master page? That's a great question. What do you folks think? Is it something that would be put in a master page, or would it be something that would be on every single page? I think it would just be on the main home screen. Well, it would just be on the page. I would put it on the master page, but then it make it change if they're logged in, make it change. Because some I've been to websites before where you get access 50% of the stuff on there, but the login's always at the top. And once you log in, you can access the other 50% of the stuff. But it's that login is on every single page. So you would want to do, I would think you'd want to set it to the master page, but in some way, shape, or form, make it to where if 
you're logged in, then its visibility is false. So that, that way it goes away and it shows that you're logged in. Okay. Uh, and that's a good point. And, and we could do that. We could put the login code actually on the master page um, to, to do that uh, and so on. And, and maybe that's something we'll do in a subsequent example. There are also pages that have a separate login page right, that you, you go to. Yeah, like for you example. You can't see anything if you don't Yeah, log in. where you can't. And then there's also stuff uh, uh, where you go to a page and um, you go to a site and as I said, you can go and do some stuff, but if you go to a certain page, you you have to log on. It's like Yahoo. If you go to Yahoo, you get the full Yahoo. If right. you sign in, then you get your customized version of right. Yahoo. Right. Or like Amazon. Right. I'll go to Amazon. And I can visit most of the site. Here you see I can uh, let's see I can uh, you know. Is that another Paul Walker? How many Paul Walker movies were there before he died? It was never released. I swear to God, there's been like his the, his career was booming ever since he died. And, and let me guess, Tupac does the uh, soundtrack, right? <laughs> Paul Walker's career has been booming ever since his poor show. Okay, I do a, uh, a search. I can do all these things. I have not logged in yet. If I go and click on Add to Cart, you can add it to the yeah. cart. You just can't, right. can't sign out until you sign in. Right. I can still do that. When I go to Proceed to Checkout, boom, there it asks me to log in. All right. So it, it depends on the nature of your site to answer your question. Something like Angel, you can't do anything until you log in. Or, actually that's not 100% true. There are a couple of like FAQ pages and stuff like that. But for the most part, you can't do anything until you log in to Angel. For other sites, there's stuff that you can do regardless of who you are and regardless if you're logged in or not. And then there's stuff that you need to be logged in for. All right. So to answer your question, that would be depending on your particular problem. You know, I would think, for example, that in our hypothetical case here, to um, you know to visit the site and to do a search to see how many softball leagues there are and to do a look to examine the schedule and stuff like that probably anyone could do but to edit someone's personal information they would need to be logged on to do that so one of those where there's no there's no answer it depends on a particular problem that you're trying to solve answer. yeah exactly it, it depends right is there a property <laughs> Right. Question on this. Let's go and let's put another button. We might as well do the session abandon now. Right, let's go and let's put another button on our login page. I'll tell you what. I will create a log off page. I would think that button should go on the player info page. Because that's. Yeah, on the player info page. I mean, page that's where you, once you look at that, then you hit, then you log off after you're done editing or whatever. That's how I would do it. Really? So well, let's put it there. Wrong most of the time. Yes, it's not wrong 95%. Does it doesn't really matter for our demonstration. We can decide again. Would, to, to, to really answer this question, we would have to consider the context of everything else that we're doing on the site. But for just the purposes of the demonstration of this, I can go in and I can put this anywhere. And it's a good place to put it for demonstration purposes um, because this will show something interesting. All right, so I go in here and I can say on click session dot. Abandon. Oops. Who 
you also have to put some redirect code, so when they log out, you want to bump them back to like a main page or something like that? Let's see. Right, that's what I have to get you in front of. All right. So let's go and let's go and let's start by logging in. So I can go here and say mz password <laughs> mlz mlz thank you What's I swear that's my password so that's my middle initial Larry <laughs> Okay I'm going to go with Larry Michael Larry's on You'd be wrong <laughs> He's got three first names How about Lou Louis All right there you go All right so now we can go and we can do other stuff. Unfortunately, we don't have other pages on this. But I could go back to default. Can you go to, Zell or to uh, Huffman's page right now? Or will it not allow you? Uh, it, it won't allow us because, again, remember that uh, that retrieves that. Now, uh, it retrieves based on the session variable. So I can go to, I can go back here, and I'm still logged in, all right? I could go to any other page I wanted to. And I can go back to remembers it's me, right? Now if I sat here talking for X amount of time, probably 20 minutes, because that's a typical default that's taken, eventually I would hit refresh and it would tell me, eh, sorry, you're, you're no longer logged in. Now I clicked the log off button and the question was, do I need to do a redirect or not? I did not do a redirect. I am logged off. Took me back there. Because when you hit the button again, it refreshed it, right? Yeah, it, it, it called it. It so called what we'd want to do is we'd want to put that code, though, in that odd click of that and all that, right? To bounce the message. You hit it once and you were locked up, and it was still showing your information. You yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a sequencing thing. Right. And, right. Let's, let's look at what happened there and, and make sure that we understand it. That's why I said this is a good. Um, educational, um, e e whether if it practically belongs there or not is one question, but it's a good uh, for educational so purposes. I've seen often enough where it acknowledges that you're logged off and then redirects, you know what I mean? Like you'll click the log off button, a page will load up that says log off, you know, session. Well, but think of Gmail. If you're in your, if you're in your, your Gmail account, okay, everybody right. probably has a Gmail account. If you're in your Gmail account and then you hit log off, it bumps you back to the login page and all that. Okay, so a lot of, lot of ways that you can do that. Let's understand what this is doing. Okay. All right. We have a button here. All right. On the click of that button, we abandon the session. We also have code on the page load method. So I'm logged in. That means the session variable is set. Right? I click the log off button. What happens? It terminates the uh, counter. Thing. Well, let, let's let's under, let's let's go through what methods get called on the player info page. All right. So session not abandoned. So all you've done is abandon. You've cleared the session variable, and that, that's all you've done. Anyone else have a different idea? When I click the button, how many methods get called? One. Session abandoned, right? But what's abandoned? 
I heard someone say two. What are the two methods that get called when I click the button? Abandon. Is it reloading on the button you click? Ah, very good. Page load event fires off, button click event fires off. And it fires off in that sequence, right? So let's imagine, let's go and draw this. And I, I, I'm, I'm showing this not because this is like the way to do it. I'm showing this because this is key to understanding the way that those events work and fire. And with a lot of things, stuff will be a mystery if you don't take into account the event in which, or the order, the sequence in which the event. So we have page load event that. If logged in or actually it says if not logged in, go to login page. We have our on click method that says abandon ship. All right, that's our two methods. This is the, the player info page. All right. I log in. Successfully log in, therefore it sets the session variable. And it redirects to that page and shows my information if it's me that logged in. Okay, so it's setting there, and the session variable has my player ID in it. The session variable for player ID has my player ID in it. It's probably number one. All right. I go and I visit ESPN.com and whatever. All right. Until one of two things happen. Either I click this button or I've been gone for a period of time, probably 20 minutes. The server is remembering this session variable so that when I come back, it looks, hey, I'm, am I logged on? Yeah, I'm still logged on because my session variable still has a value in it. And so it will pull up my data again. Let's imagine what happens when I click the button. I click the button to log off. What happens? It first looks to see if I'm not logged in, it's going to redirect me to the login page. At this point, am I logged in? Yes, I am, because I haven't executed the abandoned session yet. All right? So, in other words, the page load fires off first and says, yeah, this guy's cool, he's logged in, and displays the information. Then the on-click event happens and says, oh, abandon session. So at that point, the session variable goes away. So I'm logged off, yet I'm still seeing my information. Why? Because the page load event fired before the button event. All right. The page load event fired, said I was okay because I was logged on because at that instant I was logged on. I was in the process of logging off. All right. But at that point, strictly speaking, I was still logged on. I go and hit refresh again. All right. This time, am I logged on? Nope. So it bounces me back to that page. 
All right. Now back to my point that there's a million ways that you could solve this. All right. I would not. I would not likely have this. I I don't know. We'll, we'll, would would figure something out to do that, but. Again, the important thing was understanding the sequence which these things happen. Could you just make a call to, to at this point, could, instead of doing a redirect, could you just make a call to the load page, page load again? Right. No. I could, no, I, I could create a check for logged in method and have the page load call it and have this guy call it. I could do a redirect. I could put the code to log off somewhere else. All right, a lot of different ways that I could I could handle this. Couldn't you just flip them so that uh, the abandoned one is sequentially first? That's a that's a good question, and and the unfortunate answer is no. That's that's the behavior of the framework. Oh. All right, that's the way the framework happens. The framework has a certain sequence in which it processes these events. And you, you, can't, you can't change that, all right? You know, I mean, if the, the page load occurs when the page loads, when the page first loads, all right? That's like one of the first things it does. We can look and we can see at all these events that are associated with the page. Or not? We used to be able to see all the methods that were available. We can't see. This. Oh, good. We can't see anything anyhow. <laughs> uh, it only it was only showing the methods that were coded. It didn't show me all the methods that I could call on a page. All right. But there's a whole bunch of methods that are, that, that appear uh, on a page, and the sequence that they call is is predetermined. You kind of even if you could, you kind of wouldn't want to break that. Because ooh, that's that's cracking the open the, the the case of your um, iPhone, right? You void some warranties when you do that, all right? When you start rewiring stuff internally, all right? Let's do a quick Google search and see if we can find what the sequence of events are, are going to be. I gotta think there's a resource there somewhere for that. Page life cycle, that might be a good one. <laughs> Here's one diagram of it. So we'll skip it. Here's an overview. <coughs> All right. More or less, this supplies us with the answer. Here's the page load. Here is the postback event handle. What's the post back event handling? Well, when you click a button, you're posting back. So this happens prior to that. And it kind of has to happen in that order. Oh, and here's even more comprehensive. That the load happens before the control events happen. So the page load happens prior to the control of, uh, events. This is important to know. I mean, that raises a good question. This, and, and again, it kind of has to happen that way for the framework to work. Um, I don't think you can subvert it, and even if you did, it would be a very bad idea because you'd be doing things on pages that weren't 
properly initialized. And then all bets would be off. Question. Other questions? Even more questions. Here's a trick. Okay, you see, this is the deal. If you don't have questions for me, I come up with questions for you. My question is, is the password case sensitive? Should be. No, because it's coming off of the database, which is not case sensitive. Well, I mean, yeah, it is. But you have no. set a property for that on? You set the password property, which will blank out. Right. That's just a that's just a GUI thing. That's just because it's coming from a database. No, it's not case sensitive. Okay. Good. I, I was I, I was almost gonna like try to like flag you down because it's like you nailed it when you said that. Because we're doing a database query, the query is going to match regardless of case. So I type in MLZ, right? That's my password, and I type in password, and I'll hit cap locks. Someone can come up here as a witness. It oh, it says cap locks on. Excellent. <laughs> and I type in my password, and boom, it works. Ooh. So there's a property, and there's got to be a property then in the database that will allow for... There's a property in the database that, in many database engines, I'm not familiar with access enough. Um, to, to know this, but there's a property in many databases that say, yeah, make it case sensitive. But would we really want to turn that on? For the password, if you do it specifically for the password, you would, or... Yeah, assuming that that property exists. Yeah. What I'm saying is I don't believe, and we can look at access if you want. What database programs do you use if you're not familiar with access? SQL <laughs> Server. Nobody makes databases. It's I, cloud. I'm not familiar. Let, let me rephrase that. I don't want to say I'm not familiar with access. I'm not familiar with to that level of detail uh, of access. Um, you know who is? Who? Google. <laughs> exactly. Password property access. Okay. This is not letting me get in design view because... <coughs> You're using it I'm using website. it elsewhere, so let me close out of this. Now go into design view. And nothing in here that says to make it case sensitive, I don't think. Pardon me? Validation rules. No, that, that doesn't make it case sensitive. I could write a rule that said that passwords have to be uppercase, but it's not going to make it case sensitive. Let's see if there's a database property for that. going to be all or none if there is a property. Yeah. Let's Google it. change the way that you write your query. <coughs> Using access to be case sensitive. I'm blah, 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 blah. I think. I can't Surrey. 
Option combine, option compare. Try putting at the top of your module. Uh, that would be if we were writing something in access. We're not writing anything in access. Let's look. No, there's not a setting for that specific field. I don't know why I am looking at this. If there is a setting, it's an all or nothing setting. All right? So we don't need to worry about that, though? Um, yeah, we don't need to worry about that, but let's talk about how you would fix it. How would you fix this? How could you write code that would make this be a case sensitive. Could you, uh, well, when it reads from it, since it's not case sensitive, but when it reads from it, it's going to recognize uppercase and lowercase letters, correct? So, like, if I pulled in the information, it would recognize that this is uppercase, this is lowercase, this is uppercase, this is lowercase, so on and so forth. Yes. So, could you set that to a variable of some type in C sharp coding and then have it take the input of the user's password and match it to? Bingo. Yes. <laughs> Great answer. What are we going to do? We are going to retrieve. Right now, we're only retrieving the, the player ID. We're going to retrieve the user password, too. Then we're going to compare the user password to what the user entered in the text box. And we'll use that as an additional test to see if they've logged on. So let's go and open this guy up. Set it to a string. All right. So let's go back to our login page. I'm going to retrieve, in addition to retrieving the user ID, I'm going to retrieve the password as well, which is called user password. All right. So I'm going to retrieve the player ID and the user password from the database. All right. So if I pull data, I can't assume that we've logged on correctly because they might have entered in a password not case correct. So I'm going to do another test. I'm going to say if my my data sub 1 to string equals text box password to string now I can finally say This is a different else statement. Yeah, that, that only feeds off the first bit. Yeah. <coughs> this else statement is as if they're way off base, if they type in something and it can't even find the row in the database. What I've done is I've changed it. So if you found a row in the database, you still might not have logged on because you might not have gotten the case of the password correct. Because the user ID could have been correct, but the password could still be Well, no. The user ID and password were correct, but the password was correct not case sensitive. So now I'm going to go and look and make sure that the password matches the text in there. Because if it matches the text in there, it means I got the case right. Could, couldn't you just combine that then? Couldn't you just put if my data dot read print and 
Find the add-o one dot two string. Why couldn't I do that? Because then they, I mean, both of them would have to be true, but the ultimate goal is just to tell them that they're incorrect if they're incorrect. Okay, that's a great question, but it's missing one point, one missing one one aspect. What if I enter in something that just doesn't exist at all? Then my data read is going to fail, and there will be no value for my data sub 1. So I'll get a null reference. All right? In other words, if I read, if I read the database and it's successful, yay, I have a winner. And I could test, I could then in the same if statement, test to see if the password's matched. If, however, I don't get anything, if I have still part of that same if statement to look at column one to see if it matches the text box, well, if I don't retrieve anything, there is no column one. It's still going to do that second half of the if statement if I combine them into one big if statement. If I keep them separate, I don't even try that second part of the if statement until I know I have some data. All right? Now, what I'm going to do just for laughs is I'm going to say, are you sure your cap locks is on, which probably would not be a good idea in a real environment because you wouldn't want to give the user a tip as to why their password was wrong. But I have seen sites do that. Our caps lock is cap lock. Is cap, is cap lock on. So now we'll go and run this. But now they're going to put no into the password box. <laughs> Perhaps they will. Oh, that must be my security question. No. <laughs> my password and my security questions aren't working. So, user ID MLZ. Um, password, I will type cap locks and type in password. There's the user. Why would it ask me? Is cap locks on? All right. Whereas if I put it in all lowercase, it will successfully log me on. Notice, notice that I'm not differentiating in my error message between typing in an invalid password and typing in an invalid user ID. Right? In other words, if I type in, if that query fails and doesn't return anything, I'm not saying, hey, the user ID exists, but the password is wrong. Or I'm not saying that, well, the other way around doesn't make sense, that the password is right, but the user ID is wrong. You've got someone's password right, but not yours. You know, that, <laughs> that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense in the context of security. You would actually, that, that's up to you how you want to report the error to them. It's more secure to not tell the user that, hey, you got your user ID right, but you got your password wrong, right? It's probably a little more user friendly to tell them, hey, you got your user ID right, but your password's wrong. And you'd, I guess you'd have to balance that. I guess most places I've seen simply tell you you haven't logged on right, and they're not going to give you a hint to say, yeah, your name or password. How would you write it if you wanted to give them a hint, though, and said, hey, your name is right, but your password isn't? Well, you'd change the query, right? We're not going to go and do this, but just so that you understand, would change the query not to use the password, but just use the user ID, and then we would have essentially this code. And... This false statement then would be effectively saying, hey, you didn't get your password right. It might be case sensitive, it might, or, or you, know, you might run into a case sensitivity issue, or you may have just typed in the wrong password. So we could change that, but we'd have to change the query and change our C sharp code a little bit. Are there any questions? He just doesn't like any of your, your, your cat no, cliches. For, for eight months, I had him in my head like this going, questions. Right oh. The oh, in the Java class? Well, because okay. I had Java and HTML. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah, that would that would be brutal. And you uh, you sound much different uh, through speakers. 
I'll bet. I, I actually hate when I when I hear that. It's like, ooh, but I don't think anyone really knows what they sound like until they hear it. For your, for your, for your HTML, I swear your microphone is going like this, though. Because it always sounded like one minute you sound really close to it, the next minute you sounded really far away. So I would always have my hand at my volume control. Because I knew it was coming. You'd be quiet for just a minute and you'd go, and. Well, you, you know what? You know what happens. The, the control room is to blame for that. Yeah. Because the control room, if, I, if I'm talking quiet, they'll boost my volume. Mm -hmm. And then if I get warmed up and start talking louder or get excited or whatever, then my volume goes up and they might not catch that and it goes there. Usually what happens, frankly, is I'm not a morning person, so I'll get there and it's like, all right, class, you know, we're going we're to talk about HTML tables today. You know, you know, I'm like that. And then as I sip on my coffee and I wake up and I start to come to life, I start to talk in a more normal, louder voice. But by then, the control room has, has changed the level on my mic so that, you know, you, it blows out your ear. It's all weird. Yeah, exactly. Questions on any of this? 